Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. Happy Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Here with David and Scott for today's Sabbath school lesson, Receiving an Unshakable Kingdom. But before we get into this week's lesson, let's invite the most important person to our study this, day, uh, this morning. Yes. The Holy Spirit. David, could you pray? My pleasure. Our loving Father, Holy Spirit, and Lord Jesus Christ, we just come before you on the Sabbath day because you gave us the opportunity to come to you, Lord. You have done so much for us. You have given us your son. You have given us a kingdom. Now it is our time to show our gratitude, our love to you on this day. Lord, we'll be studying your word. This is not our word. This is your word. Help us so that we can learn from it. Allow us so that we can explain it through the Holy Spirit. And people who are listening, who will uh, see us, that they can see the word that comes out of the cross, Lord. Be with each one of us. Give us that blessing, that wisdom, so that we can go on and live a life, a changed life for you from the things that we learn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So we're going to start off reading... I know the memory text for this week is um, Hebrews 12, 28, but actually the whole section from Hebrews 12, 18 through, um, through 29 is really just a precious gem in Scripture. I'd like to start off by reading Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. And let's start with verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire, and to darkness, and gloom, and whirlwind, and to a blast of a trumpet, and to the sound of words, which sound was such as those who heard, begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the spirit and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. We see the parallel in Hebrews 18 through 24 here. We see the parallel between two different mountains. And first of all, um, we want to actually be sure, well, before we go there, one of them, God reintroduced himself to, to Israel at Mount Sinai because the he had, people had known God before, they just kind of lost their way with them. And the other is Mount Zion, the living, or the city of the living God. So just so we're clear though, mountains, everyone knows that mountains symbolize kingdoms, right? So, and in case you don't believe me, in Isaiah 2, 2, it says, now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And we all know the example given in Daniel 2, right? Where there's a statue and the, the stone comes from the sky that, that obliterates it and then grows into a mountain or a kingdom that covers the whole earth that symbolizes Christ's eternal kingdom. So we see the first mountain where God is establishing his kingdom. It is a theocracy after all, right? And the sinful children of Israel, we sit with them, and we see the contrast of our perfect, all-powerful creator, God, and a sinful, fallen creation. How Israel looks upon God with fear. Simply, they are overwhelmed being in the presence of God. Seeing the mountain, the fire, the smoke coming up, and when God speaks, they literally have awestruck reverence. The mountain shook, the trumpet blew, and God spoke. And they wanted to be as far away as they possibly could. And we'll see in Scripture how it was even too much for Moses. We just read it. The friend of God was even 
even taken back. And second, we see Mount Zion, the city of God, the assembly of the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. How that kingdom is one of peace and perfection in the presence of God with reverence and love for the one who created us, redeemed us, and transformed us to be with him for all eternity. There is no smoke or shaking here. But let me ask you this. What happened when this kingdom was initiated at the cross? What happened at that um, before at about noon? There was an... Right... There was a darkness and everything like that. And then when Christ died at 3 p.m., there was an earthquake and the tomb split open. So we read in Hebrews, let's take the next section of this. I wish we had more time, but we don't. So we're going to cover all these things in each day. On Hebrews 12, verses 25 through 29, the unshaken kingdom. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, that's referring to Sinai, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. We're going to dive more into that on Tuesday. But, and his voice shook the earth then, oh I'm sorry, I'm drawing that, Verse 27, this expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that, the, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we are by, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Now the title of this week's lesson is Receiving an Unshakable Kingdom. And we have seen how we can be physically shaken, but it, it, it has a spiritual aspect to it as well. We read in Matthew eleven seven. This is Jesus' tribute to John the Baptist. As these men were going away, the men who asked if Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? How stable was John in his faith? Except for that one time when he actually asked them to, you know, is he really the Messiah? But he was fairly grounded. And we see it has a spiritual basis. We see in James 1, 6 through 8. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Being double-minded, unstable in all of his ways. I think we could call that shaken as well. But we look at James 1, 12, where he concludes... Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Spiritually speaking, he is well grounded. The shaken is symbolic of your relationship with God and how persevering under trial, it, it makes you... In other words, if you persevere during trials and they are unshakable, you're showing that you're actually ready to receive that kingdom, a kingdom of an unshakable kingdom. And I'd like to read one last quote by Ellen White before we get into Sunday's lesson. Soon I heard the voice of God, which shook over the heavens and the earth. There was a mighty earthquake, another shaking before a kingdom, Buildings were shaken down on every side. Then I then heard a triumphant shout of victory, loud, musical, and clear. I looked upon the company who a short time before were in such distress and bondage. Their captivity was turned. A glorious light shone upon them. How beautiful they then looked. All marks of care and weariness were gone, and health and beauty were on the it seen in every continent. Their enemies, the heathen around them, fell like dead men. 
They could not endure the light that shone upon the delivered holy ones. This light and glory remained upon them until Jesus was seen in the clouds of heaven, and the faithful, tried company were changed in a moment, and the twinkling of an eye, from glory to glory. And the graves were open, and the saints came, came forth, clothed with immortality, crying, victory over death and the grave. And together with the living saints, they were caught up to meet their Lord in the air while rich musical shouts of joy and victory were upon every immortal tongue. Notice how only those who persevere with God can stand with the shaking to come. In this week's lesson, we're going to see just what it takes to partake of that unshakable kingdom. Scott, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson? You have come to Mount Zion. <clears throat> Welcome to Mount Zion. You have come to, so Mount Zion is the, the climax of um, the world's history. So as, as we remember in that image of Nebuchadnezzar, Mount Zion is that mountain that replaces the image after it's shattered into pieces. So we know that when Hollywood puts on an event such as the Oscars, all the important actors show up in their best dressed clothes and they walk on the red carpet and everyone admires them. But th this is nothing in comparison to the grandeur that God and the brilliance that he's going to display. And uh, during this lesson he's going to talk about the people who are there to receive um, this Mount Zion, the, the Mount itself. So it says, but you have come, this is now Hebrews uh, chapter 12 verses 22 through 24. Um, I was going to read the whole section, but I think uh, Byron, you already did that for us, so I'll just read these verses here. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So we're going to now um, dissect this to take it apart, to, to look at these verses and get a little bit better understanding. So first of all, um, it talks about sharing in the inheritance of the firstborn. Thus we are come uh, as citizens of the heavenly kingdom. And then the, there's a quote there from Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this assembly celebrates the inauguration of Christ's kingdom of glory. And um, there's three quotes, and I'll read both the, um, the original quotes from the book of Psalms and then uh, Paul's quoting of them in, in Hebrews. So it says uh, in Psalms 2, 6, and 7, Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare uh, the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Um, so to me also the part that says today I have begotten you seems to be referring to a future event at the time when David would have written and one part that um, I'm wondering is I think that today I have begotten you refers to the time after Christ ascended to heaven right after the crucifixion. Um, let's see, Psalms 110, 1 and 2. Um, so that one says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion to rule in the midst of your enemies. To um, rule in the midst of your enemies. And then the next quote is from Psalms 110 verses 21 through 27, which says, To declare the name of the Lord in Zion, and praise in Jerusalem when the people, peoples are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. 
He weakened my strength in the way. He shortened my days. I said, O oh my God, do not take away in the midst of my days, for years are throughout all for your years are throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will change them, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your ears have no end. So it's also interesting here to note that um, the earth itself is compared to a garment that grows old. Um, and this wearing out, in my opinion, or the opinion of the Bible, is basically a consequence of sin. So when environmentalists say that you can save the earth by following whatever they say, um, I think it's impossible for man to save. I mean, man can do some things to make things better, but he can't really save the environment. Only God can renew the environment. So instead of accepting the fact that natural calamities are judgments of God, people think these are due to man-made climate change and somehow... If we just uh, do the things they want us to do, they're going to fix this problem. Um, so, let's see. Going on here, um, let's, the sun is exalted above the angel. So now, now let's read back to the, the verses in Hebrews, which um, those quotes came from. It says in Hebrews 1, uh, verses 5 to 14, for to which angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and again, and I will be a father, and he shall be, a, uh, shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he said, Who makes his angels spirits and ministers of a flame of fire. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is in the center of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, your God has anointed you with oil of gladness more than your companions. Uh, you, the Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the earth are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will grow old like a garment, like a cloak you will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your ears will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a, your footstool? Are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit the salvation? So Mount Zion is also the place where the Son is appointed as priest forever. Uh, so the, and the fruits of the new covenant will be finally realized which is even, uh, which is when every believer becomes a perfect likeness of Christ. And that is, when Mount Zion. Um, so with that, I think we'll conclude um, Monday, uh, Sunday's lesson and move on to Monday. Sounds good. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Monday, you have come to God, the judge of all. Oh boy, judgment. Tell us about that, David. Wow, this is an, well, this is an incredible topic because Scott said that we are part of this festivity. And now we are there, and God says, welcome, I am God, the judge of all. Incredible. So to get to that festivity, we have to get through somebody who's God. He judges who's going to be there and who isn't. Sounds like a really scary situation because all of us have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. So what to do? Well, let's read um, the verse. Hebrew 12, 23. To the general assembly and church of firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. See, the judgment at Zion reminds us of the vision in Daniel 7, 9 to 10. In that moment, the children of God, whose names are in the book of life, will be made perfect. Philippians 4.13, Revelation 21.27, and 20.15.
We are present in the judgment in spirit. 1 Corinthians 5.3 Through Jesus, the Son of Man. Daniel 7.13 You see, once the judgment ends, Jesus will receive the kingdom. Daniel 7.14 Then he will come back to give the kingdom to the people, the saints of the Most High. Daniel 7.27 See, this judgment is a good judgment. This is good news for us because the accusation against us will be rejected. It's a glorious future for us. So let's talk about this judgment and this judge. The question is why do we need God as our judge? And the answer is simple. All of us sinned. And God is our creator. He is our lawgiver. He is the only one who can judge. He has incorruptible sovereignty. He is the most high. And sovereign incorruptibility, he is the most holy. You see, God alone can see the intention of our hearts. He alone can judge us. So, you know, God is the judge. Now God is also the just judge. Why? Because he himself abides by his own laws so that he may be just when he speaks and blameless when he judges. Psalms 51. God does not excuse sin. He sets the punishment of, for sin and also he pays the penalty for sin. He, to him, we are his children. He shares his inheritance, his kingdom with us. You see, his judgment is his character and therefore his perfect character is expressed through his perfect judgment. And there, that's why he's the just judge. So the principle of God's judgment Revelation 19.2 says, For true and righteous are his judgment. You see, his judgment is true and righteous judgment. Numbers 14.18 says, The Lord slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgressions. You see, God judges based on a principle of law. Galatians 5.22, But the fruit of the Spirit, we know, is love, joy, peace. See, this, Jesus said, God is spirit. So God's Judgment's principle are the fruits of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit, that is love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, patience, and self-control. See, this is the foundational principle of God's judgment. So God needs to judge. He judged us. That's why we're going to be at that mountain. Why is that judgment necessary? First and foremost, God has to cast out Satan, the accuser, the false judge, and elevate Jesus, the true judge, true king king, true redeemer. God also wants to set the institute, the true worship in spirit and truth, John 4, 22. He wants to remove our guilt for our name's sake to vindicate and restore our divinity. He also is doing it for his name's sake. So how is God doing all this? Romans 2, 16 says he's doing this through Jesus Christ. He is the one that's bringing us there. So we don't need to be afraid of this judge because he is doing it through Jesus Christ, and Jesus is love, and Jesus says God is love. So to the believers of Christ, this judgment is nothing short of a celebration, a celebration that vindicates them, giving their inheritance. God, David says salvation belongs to the Lord. His blessings are upon his people. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. You see, this judge, God, and Jesus, they're wonderful. They're, they represent us. They are the model of peace. There's nothing to be afraid of. We can boldly approach to this God, to this judge. You see, Jesus says, to know me is to know God. And he also says, to know Jesus is to keep his commandments of love and go take that gospel to the world. You see, let's talk about this three angels' message. That three angels' message emphasizes the everlasting gospel where God is the judge through Jesus Christ and his judgment for his people is eternal life. We need to celebrate that. See, God's judgment establishes Jesus' kingdom. It is a glorious judgment. It is a glorious judgment. It's a perfect judgment because in Jesus, he does not need to excuse our sin. In Jesus, God paid for the sin to establish his fallen people back to the Mount of Zion. See, let me read from the 
a spirit of prophecy, acts of apostles. Uh, Ellen White writes, the uh, Savior is presented before John under the symbols of lion of the tribe of Judah and of a lamb as it had been slain. Revelation 5, 5, 6. These symbols represent the union of omnipotent power and self-sacrificing love. The lion of Judah, so terrible to the rejecters of his grace, will be the lamb of God to the obedient and faithful. You see, God doesn't reject anybody. This judge is open to everyone. It is people that rejects him are not going to be there. They should be afraid of. But for people that love him, that truly accept him, there's nothing to be afraid of. You see, King David knew this. And that's why he wrote Psalms 23. And Psalms 23, the title is The Lord, the Shepherd of His People. And the, here, shepherd and judge can be interchanged. Let me just read two verse, verses from here. The Lord is my shepherd. Instead of shepherd, let us substitute judge. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. See, God with God, we don't need anything. We just take our heart. We just go to the Mount Zion, and he is there to openly accept us. And David writes, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever, that Mount Zion. Friends, to the practicality of this lesson, God is already there for us. He is judge, but most importantly, he is the shepherd. Shepherd does so many things to their flock, and the goal of shepherd is to keep the flock safe. God is here for us to keep us safe, and he's going to be there in Mount Zion to welcome us. Let's get ready for that. And now I give it to Byron. Amen. And what I also love is when he judges us, if you walk with Christ, if you follow his ways, if you repent when you sin, Judgment's a good thing. It is a good thing. It's something we're supposed to look forward to that reward. So only if you stray away from him do you need to be worried. Absolutely. So let's look at Tuesday's lesson. Shake the heavens and the earth. Let's start off by, by looking at, I love the lesson for today because it talks about Hebrews 12, 26, and 27. And we're going to focus on those verses in a little bit. But before we get there, let's look. We look at the shaking of the heavens and the earth, but let's look at just the shaking of the earth and see what that means. And we're going to start off in Judges, verse, uh, chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth quaked and the heavens also dripped. Even the clouds dripped water. That's the heavens as the atmosphere. Um, mountains quaked at the presence of the Lord. This Sinai at the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. And we can see examples. I'm not going to read them all because we have a lot to go through today. But we can see examples of this in Psalms 29.8 and Habak or Habakkuk um, 3.6 as well. To where the shaking of the earth when the Lord is present. And it literally is referring to the presence of the Lord. It means God is actually on location or on site. The Lord is there, just like when he descended on Mount Sinai. And the lesson talks about how God is present also. When he's present, he's there to save his people. And we see this in many places in the Old Testament. We're not going to cover everything from the lesson. We're going to kind of expand upon it. So when the shaking of the heavens comes in, Wait, before we go to that, though, we know that the unshakable kingdom exists in heaven at this moment, right? It already exists. We know that Jesus basically, well, let's read Ellen White, Christ Triumphant, the 1999 version, 108, page 308. Christ determined to bestow a gift on those who had been with him and on those who should believe on him. Because this was the occasion of his ascension and inauguration, a jubilee in heaven. What gift could Christ bestow rich enough to signalize the grace of his ascension, ascension, ascension excuse me, to the meteorical throne? Basically as our mediator. It must be worthy of his greatness and his royalty. Christ gave his representative, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. The gift could be or not be exceeded. So 
we look at this, we know that Christ ascended, ascended to heaven. We know that he was inaugurated as king. We know that that kingdom exists. Even now, we're just not a part of it yet. And we know that the Holy Spirit descended at Pentecost, so we know that this has already taken place. We read Hebrews 12, 26, and 27 now. Starting at verse 26. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. And I actually dove into the SDA Bible commentary on this, volume 7, for these two verses. And verse 26, when it says, whose voice then shook, it's actually referring back to Mount Sinai, which we've covered earlier in the lesson. And the yet once more, the quotation is adapted from Haggai um, 2, 2, 6, and 7. Its original setting of the prophecy applied to the temple as restored following the Babylonian captivity and to the first advent of Christ. Here it applies to the second advent. And we know when the second advent is, it's the second coming of Jesus. So we move on to verse 27 signifying and removing the phrase yet once more. Now this phrase implies that the second shaking is to be final. No further shaking will be required. Accordingly, whatever can be shaken will be removed at that time of the second shaking. And then we look at the um, things that, um, that are shaken, that is, that can be shaken, sin and all its works will be shaken. This present world and all that is in it will pass away. And the things that cannot be shaken, that is the kingdom which cannot be moved, including all, just, just men made perfect. And the, ver and the very end of it that may remain, when God's voice again shakes heaven and earth only, that which is right and pure and true will remain. In other words, we're talking about the saints. So we see that when God shakes the heaven and the earth, that it's the last shaking of the world we'll ever need. And the lesson talks about how for the Jews, the shaking of heaven and earth refers to the destruction of the enemies of God. And it if this is the last shaking, that is definitely true. Evil is done away with. The great controversy is over, really. So you are either unshakable at this point, or you're destroyed. Probation is closed, and judgment has been passed. So I'd like to read something from Ellen White, Early Writings, Chapter 6. December 16th, 1848. The Lord gave me a view of the shaking of the powers of the heavens. I saw that when the Lord said heaven and giving the signs recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he meant heaven, and when he said earth, he meant earth. The powers of heaven are the sun, moon, and stars. They rule in the heavens. The powers of the earth are those that rule on the earth. The powers of heaven will be shaken at the voice of God. Then the sun, moon, and stars will be moved out of their places. They will not pass away, but be shaken by the voice of God. Dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. Then we could look up through the open space in Orion. Whence came the voice of God? The holy city will come down through the open space. I saw that the powers of earth are now being shaken and that the events can't come in order. War and rumors of war, sword, famine, and pestilence are first to shake the powers of earth. Then the voice of God will shake the sun, moon, and stars, and this earth also. I think we're there. 
And if you read Matthew 24, 29, and 30, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and all the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. The only way we can be unshaken during this time is if we wholly depend on God and his strength to pull us through. Through faith and trust in Christ is the only way that we can persevere through the shaking that this world is soon to encounter. We see the earth shaking now. When the heavens are shaken, it's too late. Let each one of us turn to God and trust in him and him alone that we would persevere in that time. Scott, can you tell us about this unshakable kingdom that's to come? Yes, the unshakable kingdom. And it says here, God has announced that he will shake the heavens and the earth, which means he will destroy enemy nations. And there are some things, however, that cannot be shaken or cannot be destroyed. And here in the lesson, it gives a few verses which I wanted to look at. So um, let's look at these verses to see what are some things that cannot be shaken. And here's a quote from Psalms 15:5. He who does not put out his money at usury, nor take a bribe against the innocent, he who does these things shall never be moved. Um, and then in Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. And then Psalms 21, 7, For the king trusts in the Lord and, though the mercy of the, uh, and through the mercy of the Most High he shall not be moved. And then Psalms 62 verse 2 he is my rock and my salvation he is my defense I shall not be greatly moved and then in verses uh, in Psalm 112 6 it says surely he will never be shaken the righteous will be in everlasting remembrance so um, up until the time of the end um, Satan allow, I mean, God allows Satan to do some shaking uh, so that everybody who's not built upon the rock, which is Jesus Christ, um, in, the, uh, in the end, however, it's God's turn to do the shaking. Uh, and he will shake away everyone and everything and every doctrine that does not make Christ their foundation. Um, just like the pre-flood world, uh, could not escape from the judgment of God, so no one living at his second coming will be able to withstand his shaking. So the only way to withstand the shaking is to build upon Christ the rock. Um, and I wanted to also bring up an illustration that um, I thought was interesting from the New Testament from uh, Matthew chapter 15 verses 2 and 3. Um, about the shaking part. Uh, and and here, here Jesus says, or the, first of all, the, um, the Pharisees said to Jesus, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered unto them and said, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? And that was in verse, and then verse 9 says, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. And then when the, the disciples told uh, Jesus, did, did you know that the Pharisees were offended? And this is Jesus who could read people's thoughts. Uh, he's like, he's like I, I, it doesn't matter. He's like, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. I think another word for rooted up might be shaken. Thus Jesus clearly taught that every teaching that is part of the tradition of men, which is not based on the word of God, shall be rooted up or shaken out. 
Today, the system of Babylon that is based on the traditions of the elders, um, this, this applies to an even greater extent to those teachings. Um, and what are some of these traditions? It is more obvious and easy to talk about them in the Christian church in general, but um, so let, let's review some of those. So on one of the traditions of men says to worship God on Sunday, in spite of the fact that commandment says worship God on the seventh day. Um, another one is that the Bible clearly teaches there's only one mediator, that is Jesus Christ. Um, but the world teaches that you can have other mediators such as saints or Mary or um, other um, heavenly, uh, earthly priests. Um, and God clearly said, do not worship relics, but uh, other churches teach people to bow down to images. But could there even be some Adventists who are following some traditions of the world that are creeping in, such as uh, following the interpretations of scholars over the plain teachings of scriptures or the spirit of prophecy? It is also noteworthy that the disciples uh, weren't... Okay. Um, I think I, I already talked about that. Um, here Jesus shows that when it comes to truth, we are not to compromise with the errors merely to please people. Doing so makes you part of the false system of teaching which makes up Babylon. Ironically, the people at Christ's first advent rejected him because he was unwilling to take up the position of king and conqueror, so they killed him. However, at his second coming, they will expect him to come teaching and healing the sick, but that's only the false Messiah, the one impersonated by Christ, who will do exactly that. Uh, when Jesus shows up the second time, what's shaken is not Christ himself, but the earth. So um, the earth and all of the um, traditions of men will be shaken out, and at that point, the wicked will realize their mistake, but it'll be too late to accept him. So now is the time to build on the rock and to get out of Babylon. And let me also review. I wanted to also review here about the new heavens and the new earth. So it says the Bible is clear that God will create new heavens and a new earth. And so I, I wanted to look at uh, those verses and uh, Isaiah 65:17 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. And then again in Revelation uh, 21, verses 1 to 4, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne crying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death. There shall no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things had passed away. So um, I think we need to remember that the things that cannot be shaken are the Word of God and the people, the righteous deeds, as well as the kingdom of God Himself. Uh, that will be the unshakable kingdom. And with that, we'll pass on to the next day. I would only add righteous deeds in Christ Jesus. <laughs> that's right. That, that's the, our, that's right. the only way you can have righteous deeds. I, I, know. I just want to make sure we're clear on that for everyone listening. We have no righteousness of our own. David, can wow. you tell us about how we should be grateful? Thursday's lesson. Let us be grateful for that unshakable kingdom offered to us. You know, I just feel humbled about this um, Thursday's topic, because it feels like um, that to me that the entire book of Hebrews is written to elicit a unifying response from us to God, and that response is the 
attitude of gratitude. And um, let's define what gratitude is. It's the quality of being thankful, readiness to show appreciation for, for and to return kindness. It's a state of thankfulness and always ready to return the favor. Let's read Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, God has done all this for us. He has been working and for us to have this unshakable kingdom. So the question is, what are we to do? See, Paul encouraged us to be thankful. Hebrew 12, 28, let's show our gratitude by offering ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Romans 12, 1. Wanting to do God's will by living a righteous life is our response to everything God has done and will do for us. Psalms 15. See, good works are a response to God's love. It doesn't give us salvation, but it's a response to God's love. So they are driven by love and love alone. Romans 13, 8. They are not just words, but specific acts. Hebrew 13, 2 to 5. So you need to apply this gratitude, attitude of gratitude in our life in this day and age. Let's go and read Spirit of Prophecy, Letters of Manuscript, Volume 5, Manuscript Number 13, 1888. See, a transformation has taken place, and you are a different person. See, when you have a, the attitude of gratitude, there is a transformation. We are not the same passionate man that you used to be. You are not the same worldly man that you were. You are not the man that was giving way to the lust and evil passions. You are not this man at all because a transformation has taken place. What is this transformation? It is the image of Christ reflected in us. Then you are bearing a view that there is a company to stand by and buy on that Mount Zion. You see what she's saying is that when we have the gratitude for God, we are transformed into the image of Christ. We then will do whatever it takes to be at the celebration at Mount Zion. Hebrew 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. But those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, faith, without faith it's impossible to please God. So faith is the expression of ultimate gratitude to God. Faith in God's word counted as righteousness throughout the years, throughout the ages. We know all the stories with Abraham all the way to all of us. Revelation 14.2 says, This calls for patient endurance on the part of people of God who keeps his commandments and remain faithful. See, commandments are necessary to increase faith, to cultivate faith. Revelation 2.13, I know where you live, where the throne of Satan is, yet you have held fast to my name and have not denied your faith in me. God saying, with faith, even Satan is powerless. See, John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Commandments are a way of expressing, keeping the commandments are a way of expressing faith. Paul says, Galatians 4, 5, 14, all commandments can be summarized into love your neighbor. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul writes that Jesus tells him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You see, suffering increases faith. He wants us to welcome it as a sign of gratitude towards him. Also, Psalms 105 one says, God, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among nations what he has done. You see, when we proclaim the name of God to others, then we increase faith, and it's this expression of gratitude to God. You see, um, it says in Romans 10.10, by heart, we believe and are justified, and by mouth we confess and are saved. So faith is not just the heart, what we believe, but it is also what we do. It's both intention and action. Psalms 51, 10 to 14. David writes, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted 
to you. Do you see, this is the prayer of gratitude that God is pleased with. David is saying, give me a circumcised heart. No more hiding, no more lying, no more rebelling, oh God. Give me the Holy Spirit. Give me joy because you have gave me salvation. I should be part of that celebration on the Mount Zion. Let me have the willpower to teach others the ways you want them to live. You see, in summary, gratitude is this. It's faith in God and his son who redeemed us and shared his throne with us. God wants us to work in our hearts so that we can be changed. We can let the Holy Spirit in. The spirit of wisdom, counsel, understanding, fear, fortitude, knowledge will guide us to accept Jesus in our heart and be one with God in spirit and in truth. You see, Paul writes that, that we are created to do good. See, doing good increases our faith. It shows gratitude to God. See, we must also care for our neighbors. Uh, James 5, 18 to 20 says, if somebody turns a sinner from his sin, then a multitude of your sins will be forgiven. So it is our responsibility to show gratitude to God by letting people come to God, not doing anything to get them away from God. That's when the, fruits of the fruit of the Spirit come to play. Jesus says, store up treasures in heaven. Focus on saving souls. God doesn't, if we try to start, you know, want to keep the riches and the wealth and the treasures on this earth, that's not gratitude to God. I think Byron said that before, that our treasure should be in heaven, to saving souls, uh, you know, dying to the cross. And finally, worship God with praise, thanksgiving on our knees, acknowledge him as good, repent and obey. David says, enter his gate with praise and his court with thanksgiving. You see, I learned something interesting. The entire book of the psalm is the blueprint of God's plan to draw us to him and directs us to give God all the gratitude. Maybe that is why the book is named Psalm. Worship, praise, and gratitude belongs to God and Jesus. It starts with his law. That should be our delight. See, when we delight in the law of God, it is gratitude. See, Psalms tell us the struggles. Broken hearts and contrite spirits are God's way of perfecting us. It gives us Psalms 51, the prayer of repentance. It prophesied about Jesus and his crucifixion. It contains Exodus. It describes Jesus as our Savior, our advocate, sitting in the right hand of God. Finally, the book of Psalms 149, 150 brings us to the celebration of saints in Mount Zion, what God, where God reigns with the, son, with the saints there. What an what a, what a amazing book for us to follow. You see, Spirit of Prophecy says the essence of flavor of all obedience is our outworking of a principle within the love of righteousness, the love of law of God, the delight. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. Paul says that we may have all the gifts. We may be able to do miracles. We may be, the, uh, we may be able to do everything that Jesus told us, but if we don't have love, we have nothing, 1 Corinthians 13, 2. So the true worship, true gratitude is from the heart. With love, seeks no reward, only gives way, always forgives. Jesus is an example of that true love. Jesus is an example of true gratitude to Father. You see, um, and the gratitude is one of the most important pillars of Christian life. That is what we have to do. And what I'm realizing, that lack of gratitude to God, to Jesus, is the beginning of all sin. See, Satan's lack of gratitude to God. Adam and Eve's parents, children, husband, wife, because we're not, we don't have gratitude for each other, we hurt each other, we hurt God. See, our society is suffering from depression, sadness, conflict, and division. Imagine if the foundation of our thinking process is the attitude of gratitude. Could we not make earth like heaven? You see, Jesus and God expresses gratitude to our love for them. They accept everyone's true gratitude. Jesus will marry his people, Revelation 19.7. God rejoices over us. So friends, it is time. We need to draw near to Jesus. In these last days, God wants us to draw near to him. And the process starts with gratitude. Have we showed gratitude to our God, to our Jesus? I know we can do better. Let's start today. Amen. I know another form of that gratitude is 
Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. Absolutely. Go testimony. On. Go and tell the world. And that Greek word is martis, mm -hmm. which is actually where the word martyr comes from also. It's interchangeable. So it's almost that death of yourself and the testifying of what God's done for you. Absolutely. Beautiful thing. I take it you've done your final thoughts? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Scott? So here's my final thought. So the, the story given by Hebrews is exactly the opposite of the theory of evolution. So in evolution, you start with dirt, which makes animals, which make people, which invented God. Whereas in God's plan, it started out with the Word, who was Jesus, who then created the world, which then was uh, marred by sin and wore out like a garment. And then God, in the end, is going to destroy the world that is marred by sin and replace it with a brand new world that's not marred by sin. And that, that's found there in Hebrews um, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 10. You, O Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. And they will all become old like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up. Like a garment they will be changed. But you are the same. Your years will not come to an end. Amen. That's it. With that, I've come to an end. And I would like to read from Ellen White, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 303. The Church Inn is standing on Satan's enchanted ground. And there is necessity for a thorough conversion. Individual effort is needed. The rich promises of the Bible are for those who take up their cross and deny self daily. Everyone who has a sincere desire to be a learner in the school of Christ will cultivate spiritual mindedness and will avail himself of every means of grace. But in this church, opportunities and privileges have been slighted. One may be able to say but few words in public and to do but little in the vineyard of the Lord. But he is in duty bound to say something and to be an interested worker. Every member should help to strengthen and sustain the church. But in many cases, there are one or two who have the spirit of faithfulness that characterize Caleb of old. And these are permitted to bear the burdens and to take the responsibilities while the rest skirt all care. Caleb was faithful and steadfast. He was not boastful. He made no parade of his merits and good deeds, but his influence was always on the side of right. And what was his reward? when the Lord denounced judgments against the men who refused to hearken his voice. He said, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and has followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. While the cowards and murmurers perished in the wilderness, faithful Caleb had a home in the promised Canaan. Them that honor me, I will honor, saith the Lord. You think of this. Our home is Canaan, right? It was a promised land then. It's the unshakable kingdom for us today. I encourage every single one of us to be Caleb's, to be faithful and steadfast, so that we can be part of that unshakable kingdom with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for all eternity on Mount Zion, the new Jerusalem. Don't you want to be there? I do. I do. We have to trust. We have to believe God at his word. We've seen it in the past, and we'll see it in the future. And we just have to follow him, and he'll lead us home. That is what I hope everyone watching this will do. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we are broken. We have no righteousness of our own. And Lord, we come to you because fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's that awestruck reverence 
when we look at the creator of everything compared to us, Lord, we think we know at times, but we are just shooting in the dark most of the time. Help us to trust you, the one, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end. You've seen it all. You know it all. You've been tempted by it all. Lord, guide us in your truth. Teach us to surrender our will, ourselves, Lord, that we may be lost in you, in Christ Jesus, that we might do your will, that we might be Caleb's of this generation. And Lord, even sometimes if it doesn't make sense, help us to persevere in you and to trust that you know best. I pray this for everyone watching, that the Holy Spirit may dwell in your hearts and your minds, as well as for us in our church, and that we might do your good pleasure, that we might surrender, and Lord, that we might be with you for all eternity, steadfast and unshakable in Christ Jesus. We pray this to you, our Father in heaven, through our Savior, the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.